Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we have two outdoor legends on the show. First is UP native and outdoor writer, Richard P. Smith, to talk about his newest book. Plus, he also talks about how deer love foraging for mushrooms just as much as we do. In a way, it's much different than other books I've written, but in another way, it's very similar. And Cody Cass sent me a story. Cody had the amazing opportunity to fish with pro angler Jimmy Houston while Jimmy was here in the UP. That might be seconds or thirds on the kissing on that fish. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan I write books to educate people, to share knowledge that I've gained over the years with the public. And this book is no different. I've been supportive of Michigan's bottle bill since it went into effect in the 1970s. This year is the 45th anniversary of Michigan's bottle bill. And this book is a celebration of how successful that bottle bill has been and how great it has been for the environment. Over the 40 some years, the bottle bill has been in effect in Michigan. It's reduced greenhouse gases, equivalent to taking millions of cars off the roads. Sadly, only 10 states in the United States have deposit bills, container deposit bills, Michigan being one of the leaders. Uh, there's only two states that have 10 cent deposits. Michigan is one and Oregon is the other. However, other states are modifying their deposit laws to increase it from five cents to 10 cents, which is a positive move. It gets more people to re redeem the deposits. If all the, of the states had deposit laws, it would reduce greenhouse gases tremendously and help reverse climate change. That's one of the things talked about in the book. There's a chapter on how states that don't currently have deposit laws can establish them. Uh, it would be a major step in reversing climate change if all states went to deposit loss. And one of the benefits, one of the reasons I wrote this book is I've reduced my grocery bill, saved money by collecting returnable cans and bottles that other people don't want. There's lots of cans and bottles out there people don't want to claim to deposit on that anyone can pick up. I explained in the book how people can do that and how I've been doing it. The last two years, I've made over $3,000 on returnable cans and bottles that other people don't want. That's helped cover my bills. And with today's economy, I thought a lot of people would like to know the same information I've been using to make money, to save money in the grocery store and on my gas bill for my vehicle. I've been doing it for years since the bottle bill started, but I've been doing it really actively in the last few years researching for the book. There's also a chapter on organizations that conduct can and bottle drives. Moosewood Nature Center is one of them here at Presque Isle. For people who don't want to return the cans and bottles themselves, they can donate them to organizations that conduct can and bottle drives. So somebody derives a benefit from those deposits. And at the same time, it benefits the environment, big time. We'll hear more from Richard in the final segment of the show. I recently had the pleasure of fishing with legendary professional angler Jimmy Houston. If you don't know who he is, Jimmy was a key influencer for growing bass angling in the early days and has had his own television show for over 47 years. 
Known for his barrage of jokes and his iconic laugh, there was no way we could have captured all of Jimmy's antics into one episode. So I picked through a few of my favorite moments fishing with Jimmy to share with you all. It's just beautiful up here. I was up here working for Shell Rotella at a, a grand opening and I said, man, I gotta go fishing. I happened to run into Cody and Cody. Ooh, that's a nice fish, wherever this is. Do you get, a, do you get one on there, under yep. that dock? I, I did really say that's a great place to get one right there. Ooh, that looks like well, a- beat you to it. And that looks like a good one too. Yeah, it is. Well, this is a light powered rod. Oh, I, so see, I see him run around down there. It's a light powered rod, so Seven it's pounds. Yeah. Well, seven, maybe this not. This ain't no seven pounder. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, maybe not. No, he's decent, probably yeah. Oh yeah, he's a good. Nice fish. Good, nice northern bass right there. And that's what we're fishing for. We're gonna fish maybe several little lakes over here this evening and maybe tomorrow. We're out here only about an hour before dark, but we thought we'd, that one's kind of skinny. And most of the fish I see up here in the north are real fat. Yeah, this is. That's probably a male, it's uh, or may, it could be a female, it's just already spawned out, but it looks like a male. Yeah, it's don't, been. Don't, don't, I don't know, her tail's kind of messed up though. I mean, it's a female. You can kiss that yeah, one I'll, if you I'll want, Cody. That, that wouldn't hurt anything. Are. But don't be kissing any boy there fish, not on, no. not on this show. <laughs> Look at there. <laughs> that fish. It's actually hooked outside the outside of the mouth. You know what that means, Cody? When they're hooked outside the mouth, it's swiping pretty hard at it. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> no, he just no, I, he just. And that fish has been caught before recently, a couple of times. Look at this. This is catch and release. This is why it works. See that? That's an old wound, probably a treble hook of some kind. Mm -hmm. There's an old wound, probably a worm. And where that spinnerbait got it, it was right over here. There's not even a mark where my spinnerbait got it. <laughs> that might be seconds or thirds on the kissing on that fish. Yeah. She's not very smart. Fishing one half naked. Maybe it was embarrassing, those fish. <laughs> We're so embarrassed. We're not going to bite that thing. It might attract them a little bit more, too. <laughs> it might. I'm not fishing for the boy fish. I'm fishing for big girls. Might I guess, be embarrassing them. I guess you need a well-dressed spinnerbait for that. <laughs> Maybe maybe you can uh, have Lucky Craft make a tuxedo color one for you. A little bit difference there in the skirts. This guy right here, I've been trying to break it. <laughs> you know, see, it's got the old, it's got the old the red man spinnerbait. It's got the old safety pin bin. This is why we used to build spinnerbaits when we were kids. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd buy safety pins, large safety pins. They were already made like this. And if one end was pointed and the other end had a snap on it that you snapped it down into. We'd cut that off and, and put the wire around a, a hook and put it in a jig mold. And we'd have this part of it. We'd cut the sharp point off, put a little bend in the end of it, and put a blade out, and that's how we made spinnerbaits. And so when we built the original Red Man spinnerbait, that's the way we built them. We didn't have R bends and U bends. But the deal is, and of course, this is a short arm, so when you bring it through the water, it shakes, shakes back and forth this way. You see that vibration. Even with that small blade, it really vibrates. I sold Sam Walton, the guy that started Walmart. Mm -hmm. I sold him those when he had 13 stores. Oh wow. Thir 13 stores, isn't that something? One of the things that happens with a red man that's a negative is that if your line gets a wrapped around in here, it can get down in that, in that, in that round, in that uh, circle bend. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, if, when that happens, you have to check your line. Now I can see a little nick in it right there and feel a nick. You might have to retie a little bit more often. But quite honestly, unless you're using braid, you probably are not tying or retying your bait as often, often as you need to. And easily you can get a damaged line and you might have, like this is 15 or 20 pound test line I have on here, big line. But that nick I had on there was probably about six or eight pound strength. So I could get a three or four pound fish, set the hook and break the line even sometimes on the hook set. Or if I get a nice one on and he, and he uh, runs and breaks your line, you're going, oh my gosh, that fish broke 20 pound line. Well, he really didn't. What he broke was where it was six pounds or eight pounds because you had a nick in it. So you want to retie that thing as, as, you know, pretty often, pretty often. Fishing line, well, I'm not going to say fishing line is cheap because there's nothing cheap anymore in this world we live in. But fishing line is, is inexpensive compared to losing what might be your PB. The morning bite was steady but slow. We caught quite a few fish, but pretty small overall. 
Jimmy and I headed into some vegetated bays to try to change our luck. These areas are usually unfished and can hold some pretty big fish. I usually use a frog or a punching rig in this heavy cover to draw bites. Jimmy was using it that red man spinner bait to attempt to trigger a reaction strike. We would get, oh, oh that's a nice fish. That was a Might pike. Be, bitch off. <sighs> bite, bite it off. Yeah, it's a big. That, I had that, you know, I had that frog for about three years. Well, that, yeah. That same frog. And I was, you know, I was just talking about that the, the other day about how, uh, how I've been very lucky not to break that off, and here we are. Those big pikes will do it. It's almost a, it's almost sentimental, you know. It felt like a big, heavy fish. But yeah, it's it was, a big pike. I'm telling you. I don't think he'll bite again. Yeah, hopefully, get my frog back. He bites it, I'll get your frog back. <laughs> Yeah, it's, to me, it's more of the game. Like if, if I say it, me or whoever's in the boat with me, if we figure out what works and we almost solve that puzzle of catching fish, I don't care if I catch a single fish after that. And as long as I, you know, I'm not getting skunked and if you know, whoever I'm, I'm fishing with catches a whole bunch, I think it's, a, it's kind of a team sport when you look at it that way. You know, like you could be using different techniques or sometimes, you know, whether you're helping somebody land yeah. the fish or whatever, it's just, to me, that's, that's, that's my, that's the, the puzzle is my favorite part of fishing. Well, in all those, all the, all those early years of bass, you know, we drew partners every day. And so we fished, you know, in, in a, we, we fished in competition in the same boat with Roland Martin and Bill Dance, Ricky Klun. You know, the, the, I, I like to draw those really top name fishermen because I knew that what we were going to do that day was use all the knowledge and all the places and all the patterns I had figured out, also all of what he had figured out. <clears throat> and we were never trying to beat each other. All we were trying to do is catch a, a big limit of fish. I thought maybe you were trying to teach him how to swim. <laughs> oh, no, I think he's, he's showing me he's good at that. He, he knows how to do that already, don't he? Sort of coming oh, he's coming. He's coming. Got him out of the grass? I think so. Get him up there, Cody. Let's take yeah. a look at him. I got a light line on here. This is only seven the pounds for the leader. The pike? No, it ain't. <laughs> I know you're pulling my leg there. <laughs> the pike. <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. That's a kissing fish, eh? <laughs> yeah. He's chunky, that sunshine's too. kind of driving some of them under there. You know, we fished some of these deeper docks this morning and couldn't get a bite. Nice fish. That uh, that sunshine's helping us. <laughs> On the wrong side of the cable. <laughs> Not very big, but <laughs> I don't know how many fish I've caught in tournaments. Throwing back in between a boat and a dock, but throw throw over the rope, like I did on that one there. Sometimes you get a real big one back there too. You got you got to kind of lift over all that stuff. Yesterday was a little slow, uh, last night when we went out, uh, it's, it was sunny and everything like that. And then uh, today it seemed like we had a lot, little bit more success when that sun came out. You, you were nailing them on the spinnerbait earlier when it's still cloudy. I was struggling with using finesse plastic. Yeah, mostly pike. I caught a few bass on that spinnerbait, yeah. but mostly pike. And, uh, and it, there's so many bluegill out there. I was looking on my Garmin live scope and there's so many bluegill, it's amazing. So they got a lot to eat in this lake. Yeah, when the sun came out, it seemed like that was, they were tucked way underneath the docks. Like you, you'd catch, you know, maybe we caught one or two on the outsides, and then I got a few going right underneath the dock, yeah. you know, skipping a lure under there and getting those, you know, third or fourth yep. fish off the same docks, which is pretty crazy because there was open water. It seemed like it was very slow for us, even in, even when there was weeds. Yeah, you know, but when that sun came out, it was early in the morning, you got a lot of shade because of the sunrise coming up and you got the trees and everything around the lake. And so you have a lot of shade. You chase the shade as long as you can. But once that, that goes away, the sun gets up high in the middle of the afternoon, the only shade they have is around the docks. And so those darker places, and the last two or three fish that, that we caught, we caught in water just about that deep. It's oh, yeah. so shallow, but they're back in underneath something. Yeah. And uh, we even caught a few of them throwing between the pontoon <laughs> and the dock. They throw over a rope or something. That's yeah. kind of fun, you know, but, and uh, they, they weren't big fish, but, but they were a lot of fun to catch. Yeah, up here, it's not like, you know, down Oklahoma or everywhere else that you fished. But yeah, there's a lot of fish and they're always aggressive because that feeding window that they have before winter is so small up here yeah. that they'll crush a lot of different lures. You just gotta find them though. Yeah, yeah. Well, we found them this afternoon or they found us, I don't know which. <laughs> I appreciate fishing with you, it was fun. 
uh, yeah, we didn't catch, you know, the size that you're used to, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, just how, how he is on camera is exactly how he is off camera. Just, <laughs> just a barrel, just like a barrel of monkeys. We just have fun. We yeah. just have fun. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Cody. Thank you so much, yeah, bud. Ho hopefully sometime in the future for paths cross again, you know, it'd be great to fish with you. Sounds again, good. Sure. Sounds good. We'll do it. I'd say one of my favorite moments was Jimmy taking the time to talk with a few fans on the shoreline. Even with him anxiously wanting to get back home after being on the road for two weeks, he took the time to chat with a kid who was waiting five hours to see him. Being over 1,100 miles from home, he talked to everyone like they lived right next door. I'm glad to have been able to hang out with Jimmy, learning more about the outdoor media industry, fishing, and even a few new dad jokes I can tell while I'm out fishing. <laughs> I've been an outdoor writer, that's my career, and I'm always looking for ways to learn about wildlife, and especially deer, and to photograph them. So by gaining their trust, I could get excellent photographs and video and learn about how they interact, their behavior, and learn a tremendous amount about the animals. I didn't really realize how much deer ate mushrooms until I started walking with them. There's a group of deer I started walking with. They learned to trust me. I could go with them wherever they went and watch what they did. And actually, you have to be right with the deer to see them eating mushrooms. They eat a lot of them when they're first emerging from the ground. Um, they eat a variety of mushrooms. I've, I'm not good at identifying mushrooms, but I've seen them eat red ones, yellow ones, green ones, white ones, brown ones, all different kinds of mushrooms. This year was the first time I've seen them eating chicken of the woods. And that's a fungus that's edible for people. Very, it's favored among a lot of people. I saw some, a big patch of it on a log and I photographed it. And then I saw where deer had been nibbling at it. And I just happened to be there a couple different times when bucks were feeding on that chicken of the woods. I know the morels. I haven't filmed them actually eating morels, but I know they eat morels. They eat puffballs. But I was amazed at the variety of mushrooms and fungus that deer eat when I started walking with them. And I carried a video camera with me and I was able to capture video of them actually eating mushrooms. That's an advantage of having the deer trust me that I could be right with them and film. It takes a long time. It's, you don't do it one time you got to spend a lot of time with the animals over a period of weeks and months for them to get used to you and learn to trust you. It helps if you're in an area where they're not hunted. In a park where there's no hunting, they're used to people anyway. It's just a matter of fostering that trust by spending a lot of time with them. You know, within five to 10 yards, you know, very close. In fact, to film them eating mushrooms, you have to be right with them I'll see mushrooms in the direction they're going, and I'll get in position and film the mushrooms as they're approaching them. I find in woods where there's oak trees, a lot of oak trees, and they'll forage on acorns if they're present and then eat the mushrooms too. And they seem to prefer them when they're emerging from the ground or soon afterward when they're fresh. Most of them they eat. Uh, <clears throat> once they get old and dry it out, they don't eat them. They don't eat stuff that's not nutritious for them. So it has to be good for them. And I'm sure some of the mushrooms they eat are not edible for people. I wouldn't try eating some of the red ones I've seen them eat. They scream poison. <laughs> Richard has wrote numerous books and made DVDs about his encounters with whitetail deer, hunting whitetails, and big buck stories. Richard gave me his DVDs, and the whitetail footage he has captured is fascinating and makes me want to spend even more time outdoors filming wildlife. I've done this walk with whitetails year round, as you'll see on the DVD. I've got bucks fighting, bucks rubbing their antlers, shedding the velvet. I've learned about antler development of bucks. Uh, there's a three-year-old buck that I'm watching right now. He was a spike corn as a yearling, he had spikes. In fact, he had one spike that was five or six inches long and one very short that was only two or three inches long. As a two-year-old, he was a seven-point. And this year, as a three-year-old, he's got a nice eight-point rack. Filmed does nursing their fawns. I've confirmed what we were often told, that does don't spend a lot of time with their fawns. They'll stash them somewhere where they think they're safe, 
and they'll roam around and feed, but they're usually still close enough that if there's a threat from a predator or something, they can intervene. Find Richard's books and DVDs on his website, richardpsmith.com. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.